from Tetiana Cordero. She's our, one of our missionaries serving in uh, Brazil, in Porto Alegre, Brazil. She starts with, dear friends, I want to praise the Lord for the blessings we receive through Vacation Bible School outreaches. Our Villanova Church kids invited friends to VBS and we invested in them during this week. I had the opportunity to share the gospel with Alana, who praised the Lord that she has, been, has placed her faith in Christ. Pray that she can come out to church faithfully. It was a blessing to help the church at Ponta Grossa the following week as well. Thank you for praying. Also, to praise the Lord for the work of the Holy Spirit at camp. This was our first camp post-COVID. A lot of our campers were new kids, and it was exciting to have them in a place that gave numerous opportunities to hear the Word of God preached. The counselors helped promote an atmosphere of Christ-likeness in each activity and gathering. Uh, Kajab Asol is fruit from the camp's abroad program from the wilds. This was also the first Christian camp experience for our young teenager, Emily. Emily has a willing heart and desires to serve the Lord. Pray for her as she learns to walk with the Lord. I also want to praise the Lord for Clara's desire to have a weekly Bible study. I was thrilled when this 16-year-old Clara came up to me after an evening service and specifically asked if we could start studying together. Her desire is to give a reason for the hope that is in her, or in her words, to be able to explain to others her beliefs using the Bible. We started in March, and she says each week that she is learning more and enjoying the study. Also for the opportunity to visit our college student, Ty, and meet her two doormates. Ty started Bible college two years ago, and we have seen her struggle, yet persist in her studies. Her teachers and supervisors commend her, and it's a blessing to see her blossom in this environment. Each Saturday, she helps with the kids club, goes out soul winning in the afternoon, and participates in the young adult group in the evening. She loves music and has taken piano and flute lessons. And um, just a note here, one of the, the flute that she plays was given to her by um, a lady, uh, when she was home on furlough, I uh, gave her a flute to give to this young lady, so that's kind of neat. Also, um, to pray for the following, for the rings as they head to the United States for a six-month furlough later this month. Please pray for their travels and the continuation of ministries here. The church will be led by one of the men in our church, Brother Gilberto. He has been teaching Sunday school class for the past year and will now be focusing on all the services for this church plant. And she says, for me, as I take a monthly ladies Bible study, a weekly Bible study with Maria Helena, as well as other church ministries with Tammy's leave. Thank you for your continued prayers. You know, you think a, a single woman wouldn't be very busy on the field because she's, you know, she's not in the pulpit and, and doing other things. But this young lady is, um, every day is packed in her life uh, between music lessons and leading ladies Bible studies and working with the teens and, and playing music and, uh, and spending time with the ladies. Uh, she's a, a true benefit to the field there. Um, let's just remember our sister this morning. That's the group I fit in with a little bit more. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, it's good to be here this morning. And um, you might notice the same accent, but uh, a little bit different in looks. Just a little bit. I don't know what difference, but a slight difference there. But uh, Dad is away uh, this week, and so he asked if I would fill in this morning and preach. And so I've always... Um, you know, when um, I felt called of God to be here, um, when I went off uh, to Bible school, I, I took a, a one-year Bible program, and that's, that's not anything special, believe me. I probably played a little bit too much basketball and ping pong when I should have been studying. But um, after that, 
you know, started, you know, really praying what the Lord would have me to do and really just felt like he wanted me to be here and uh, to serve in the church with dad and um, and whatever capacity was needed. And um, and that's that's always different things, but it's it's where the Lord's called us and uh, never felt like he would have me go anywhere else like. Uh, um, there's been other people trying to one Caleb Worley that keeps trying to get me to come to New Mexico and uh, but uh, I keep trying to get him to come here too so that's it in all fairness so but uh, I, I feel privileged to be here this morning and to bring the Word of God to you and uh, what an amazing God we have um, his word is unbelievable, and uh, his word tells us who he is, and um, that's what we're going to talk about a little bit this morning. But we're going to talk about uh, in a little bit of different uh, capacity and, and what he's done for us. Uh, that maybe, uh, well, we don't hear it very often. We're going to talk about Jesus as being our great high priest this morning. Um, we, you know. We talk about being, you know, he, he was a prophet, and he, he was a prophet. He had uh, prophecies. He prophesied how he was going to die, and he prophesied different things. And and we talk about him being a king, and he is a king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And um, all that is true. He's the Lamb of God. That's true as well. Um, he fulfilled his role as the Lamb of God. But we're going to look at his role as our great high priest this morning. So if you've got your Bibles, turn over to Exodus chapter 28. And we're just going to do a little bit of a review real quick. Uh, not, not too much. But we're just going to look at the, the role of the high priest a little bit. But let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you are our great high priest, Lord. Uh, you did something for us that no other one could do, and uh, because of that, we have redemption through you, and uh, we thank you so much for that, Lord. I pray that we, as we open the pages of Scripture this morning, that your word would speak to our hearts, uh, that uh, we would be able to see clearly the truth that is contained in your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So Exodus chapter 28, we're going to look at the first verse. We're going to look at the, the office of the high priest just for a second here. And um, he, the, there were high priests on earth, and we're going to talk about that. So in Exodus chapter 28 and verse 1, the Bible says, And take unto you, uh, and, and take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. So this, this office was an office that was ordained by God. This office was something that he put in place, uh, this job as the priest, as, of the great high priest. We're going to look at um, the responsibilities or the job of the high priest. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 3, it says, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. This was the job of the high priest. He was to offer gifts and sacrifices. Okay. Now let's look at um, Exodus chapter 26. Exodus chapter 26 and verse 33. Um, we're just going to look real quick at where would the high priest give the offering. So Exodus chapter 26 and verse 33, it says, And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches, that thou mayest bring in thither with the veil the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall defi divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And now drop down to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16, Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 15 through 16, the Bible says, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil. 
So the, the veil was to separate the holy place from the most holy place. And now the, in Leviticus 16, verse 15, he's to kill the goat. He's to bring the sin offering, uh, bring the blood within the veil. And do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock. And sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. So this, this offering that this, and we're, we're going to look at this now in, in Hebrews chapter 9. This, this job of the high priest, he would go into the holy place. He would go uh, past the veil into the holiest of places. And that's where he would offer the sacrifice. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 6, the Bible says, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Now listen to verse 7, but into the second went the high priest alone once a year. So this specific uh, offering and this specific sacrifice that we're talking about now is a sacrifice that would happen once a year. And that the high priest would enter into this holy place once a year. And uh, so this, this was kind of the, the job of the high priest to do to carry out these uh, uh, things that he had to do that he had to accomplish all this was uh, put in place by God it was given to Moses this, this is how I want it done these are the instructions that I have for you so this would be the job of the high priest and we've kind of looked at this a little bit but now let's look in Leviticus chapter 17 Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11 and we're going to see what the offering was, what the priest would bring into the holy place with him, what he would bring in past the veil. The Bible says in verse 11 of Leviticus chapter 17, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given unto you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Okay, this is, this is specifically speaking of this offering that they were to bring into the holy place, that they were to put on the altar, and it was to be the blood uh, of that animal that was slain. They would bring that into the holy place. Now look into Hebrews. If you keep your finger in Hebrews, it'll probably do you some favor. Uh, I should have said that to start. But Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 7. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 7. And this is, this is again, is, is speaking to uh, these earthly high priests that would carry out these uh, jobs. Uh, where, and we're talking about what he would bring in to uh, pass the veil into the holy place. In verse 7 it says, But unto the second went the high priest alone once a year. And here it is, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. So this is just a, just a real quick review. Uh, we, could, we could spend a long time going through scriptures and um, looking at all the specific duties of the priest and the, you know, all the different things that they would carry out. Uh, that's not the purpose for this morning. We want to talk about Jesus as being our high priest and not, not these earthly priests that would would carry out this job year by year, that they would bring uh, the blood of the, the, the goats into the holy place and they would offer it upon the altar and they would do this once a year uh, for the sin of the people, for, the, for their own sin and for the sin of the people. And so that's, that's what they would do. But now we're going to look at Jesus as being our high priest. So let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, and we'll be in Hebrews for pretty much the rest of our time this morning. So Hebrews chapter 8, in verse 1, the Bible says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. 
We have such a high priest, the Bible says. Jesus is our great high priest. And he is sat down on the right hand of the throne in the majesty of heaven. Now let's look at this real quick because just like the, the, the priests were uh, given instructions by God, Jesus was ordained by God to be uh, our great high priest. If you'll look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 20, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 20, the Bible says, And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest. For those priests, it's going to be talking about the, the Old Testament priests that would offer these gifts. For those priests were made without an oath. But this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is our great high priest because God promised him to be. The Bible says that the Lord swear and will not repent that thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. If you look in uh, the, the reference in the Old Testament that this is referring to is Psalms 110 verse 4. The, it's a, it, the same wording, the Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God promised him, he, he gave an oath that he, Jesus, would be that great high priest. All the priests before that, that was their job, that was their responsibility, but they did not have an oath that they were going to be the great high priest. They, th this was something that they carried out, but this, Jesus was given an oath that he was going to be the great priest high priest. So now let's look at what his role is as the high priest. If you'll look in Hebrews chapter 8 again in verse 3, the Bible says, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Okay, we talked about this uh, uh, to begin with. The, the high priest, it was their job to offer gifts and sacrifices. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Now listen to the second part of this verse. Wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. So Jesus' role as a high priest is going to be offer is to offer gifts and sacrifices. He's going to offer a sacrifice. The Bible says it is of necessity that this man have somewhat to offer. It's not an option. This has to be done. It's of necessity. So now let's look at where this offering would be made, where this offering would take place. So in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24, the Bible says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. We're going to look at where Jesus is going to make, where this, where this offering is going to be made, where this sacrifice is going to be given. And in verse 24 of Hebrews chapter 9, it tells us he's, he's not offered into the holy place made by hands, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So what we're going to look at now is the true temple, the true uh, holy place is in heaven. It's not on earth. It's, this wasn't an earthly place. This wasn't going to be an earthly sacrifice. Now, if, and you probably can't see it very great from where you're at, but after, if you want to come up and take a look at it, there's a little uh, replica of what the tabernacle uh, would have looked like, and I think it's, I think it's a pretty good uh, example of it. And, uh, but we're going to look at this. This wasn't the holy place where Jesus was going to make his offering. This wasn't the veil that he was going to enter into. This wasn't going to be an earthly sacrifice. It says in Hebrews, again, 924, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 8 again. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1, the Bible says, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. 
We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the, of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now I think we need to look at verse 2 carefully here and realize that Jesus is a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, the Bible says, which the Lord pitched and not man. So the question, and, and this question has been asked, and there's different theories of it, but is there a temple, is there a tabernacle in heaven? And I believe there is. I believe very clearly that the Bible says that there is. In verse 2, again, in Hebrews chapter 8, he's a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. For every, verse 3, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Remember, this is a, it's a necessity that this man, that Jesus, our great have, high priest, have somewhat to offer. Now let's look at verse 4. It says, For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer according to the law. Okay, this verse again tells me that this offering that Jesus is going to make, it's not on earth. It says, For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest. This sacrifice, this offering that he's going to give, it's not on earth. It is in heaven. It is indeed in heaven. It says, if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, and let's just look at this point just a little bit more. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 11, the Bible says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change of the law. There's that word of, again, there is made of necessity a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So if, if Jesus, great high priest, if he is to carry out his offering on earth, he's from the wrong tribe. He's from the tribe of Judah. The, he sprang up out of the tribe of Judah. Okay, so this, this cannot be an earthly uh, sacrifice. Look at verse 13 again. It says, For if he of whom these things are spoken of pertaineth to another, another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for, after, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest. Okay? Jesus is different. He's not the same as all of these other high priests. He's not the same as these uh, priests throughout the years that have offered these sacrifices, that have gone in once a year for their own sin and for the sins of the others. He's different. Now let's look again at Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. All these other priests, all these actions that they carried out, the Bible says, "...who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things." As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So we're looking at where, where is this holy place? Where is this tabernacle that Jesus is entering into? And, and the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 that everything that was carried out on earth, it was an example. 
it was a shadow of heavenly things. And in the last part of verse 8, it says to make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Now, what is an example? Okay, if we have an example of something and we copy that example, the original already existed. Is it, right? Does that make... That if we have an example of how to build something and we build it, we followed the example. And then it says, a, a, a shadow of heavenly things. How do you have a shadow? Okay, you can't have a shadow without something that is already there. Okay, if there's a shadow of something, it's because something else already existed. Okay, in, 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 in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, it says, "...who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things." And then at the end of the verse it says, For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. What is a pattern? Okay. Um, it's something that you follow. I've got a few kids that are, you know, in first grade and stuff still, and they get, you know, these patterns of how to write cursive, and you follow along the same lines. It's an example. It's in a pattern. Okay, this tabernacle here is a pattern. It's an example. It's a shadow of the true one. The one that Jesus, our great high priest, entered into, it's not made by hands. It's not made by man. It's not a man-made place. He enters into the true tabernacle, listen, that he himself pitched, the Bible says. It is a literal place. It is a, an actual place in heaven where this sacrifice, where this offering is going to be made. Listen to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, if you'll turn there real quick. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10 through 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 10. The Bible says, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Now listen to verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Now listen, this is very important. When the priest, when the high priest would bring the blood into the holy place, when they would bring that within the veil, what did they bring with them? Did they kill the animal inside the holy place? No, they did not. This was not the place of slaughter. Inside the holy place is the spot where the offering would be given. This is, this is the spot where the blood would be placed on the mercy seat, the Bible tells us, for the sin of the people, for the sin of the, 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 the high priest that was presenting it, and for the sin of the people. Listen, this was not the place of slaughter. This was the place of offering. Just as the lambs were not killed in the holy place, but their blood was brought into the holy place. Jesus was not killed in the holy place either. Where he died was not the holy place. Where his blood was brought, that is where the holy place is. He is going to fulfill his office as the great high priest. Let's look on a little bit more. What would the offering be uh, that Jesus brings into the holy place? Remember again, it says, For every high priest is ordained to give gifts and sacrifices. Remember, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Okay, so if we can establish that the, the holy place, this, this, this place that Jesus is going to enter into, it's not an earthly place. It's not a place on earth. It is actually in heaven. If he's going to enter into this place and he's going to offer a gift, what is the gift that he's going to offer? What is the sacrifice that he's going to bring? Remember, it's of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. In Hebrews chapter 9, let's look at Hebrews chapter 9 verse 11.
Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11, it says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. There it is again. That is to say, none of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. Remember, everything that they would do, this was, an, this was a shadow, this was an example of what our great high priest Jesus was going to do. This was just an example. This was not the real thing. This was, this was foreshadowing what, what Jesus was going to do for us. And it's of necessity that Jesus has somewhat to offer. But when he enters into the holy place in heaven, listen, he doesn't enter into the holy place with the blood of calves and of goats. He enters in by his own blood, the Bible says. By his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. Verse 13, the Bible says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot, to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Listen, this offering that Jesus brings into the holy place, it's not the blood of calves and of goats. It's not the offering of anything else. It's the offering of himself. It's the offering of his own blood. Listen, the place of suffering was the cross where he died for us, where he took on the sin of the whole world. That was the place of death. That was the place where he became a curse for me and for you, where he took our, our sin and his own body on the tree. Listen, that was the place where he did that. But then he enters into the holy place in heaven with his own blood and having attained eternal redemption for us. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9 now. Hebrews, we're still in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. It says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also be of necessity the death of of the testator. Verse 17, For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Now, the, the, pay attention to this part here, okay? Verse 18, it says, Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. What was that first testament? It was the testament that God gave to Moses. Okay, let's look at it a little bit more. In verse 19 it says, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So this is all, all those verses we just looked at. They're speaking of that first testament that God gave to Moses. It was, it was given to Moses. It was confirmed. It was, it was given to Moses. It was confirmed with blood. Now listen to verse 23. It says... It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Listen, there's that word necessary again. We've looked at it three times, and here it is again. The Bible says it was necessary that the patterns of the things in heaven should be purified with these. 
Purified with what? With the pattern of the things that we just looked at, with the pattern of the things that Moses went through, that, that the sprinkling of the blood, it would be brought in, it would be put upon the altar. And then the last part of that, verse 23, it says, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Why is it better sacrifices than the ones that Moses would give? Because it's not the blood of calves and of goats. It's better sacrifices because it's His own blood. He enters into the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. That's why it's a better sacrifice. That's why it's better. Uh, listen to verse 24. It says, For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true. There it is again, the, the place made with hand, the, the first tabernacle that was made, it was a figure of the true. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Listen, he enters into the presence of God. I love the last part of that verse. What does it say? For us. Our great high priest, listen, the job of the high priest, would go. he would go into the holy place once a year by himself and not without blood. Jesus enters into the holy place once by himself with his own blood. Listen, for us. That's the amazing thing about it. Listen, I, cannot in, I could not enter... There is nothing that I could do. There's no good work. There's nothing that I could do of my own that would give me access into the holy place. Jesus did something. He accomplished something in His role as our great high priest that no other one could accomplish. No other one could do. He's the only one that has the oath of Him being the great high priest that was going to enter in not once a year, not over and over again, but once in the presence of God, He's going to enter, and He's going to enter in for us. Amen. Listen, let's go down um, to Hebrews. We're going to look at what His uh, offering accomplishes now. What does His offering accomplish? In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 17. Hebrews uh, six chap chapter or chapter six verse seventeen it says, "Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of His counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope." set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Listen, our hope entereth into the veil. Our hope, Jesus Christ, enters into the veil. He is our hope. I love the song, uh, uh, The Solid Rock. Listen to this verse of that song. It says, His oath his covenant, His blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. Listen, we have a hope. We have, a, we, we have an oath that's confirmed by two immutable things. Listen, that it was impossible for God to lie, that we can lay hold upon. Listen, we have this hope that we can lay hold upon that is set before us. Listen to verse 19 again. It says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. That song says, When darkness veils His lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. And every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil. Man, Jesus, our great high priest, He enters into the holy place on our behalf for us, for me and for you. He goes someplace that no one else is able to go. He goes in by Himself into the holy place with His own blood, and He offers it there for me, and that's my anchor, and it holds. It's steadfast. It's sure. It's unchanging. 
Look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 22. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 22, by so much Jesus, or by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Listen, his, his offering, his sacrifice, it, 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 it secures me. It gives me this hope. But you know what? It also secures and it also sets apart this New Testament. Listen, this new covenant that he's made, his offering confirms that. Listen to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. The Bible says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Listen, the, his offering is the blood of the everlasting covenant. It seals it. It stamps it. It has his stamp of approval on it. It's accepted by God because of his offering. This is one of the things that his offering accomplishes. The second thing that it accomplishes is it takes away sin. This is very important because in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4, the Bible says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Listen, the offering that Jesus makes is different. It's not like the ones that they would bring into this holy place that the Bible says could never Take away sin. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11. It confirms this again in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11. It says, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Boy, I'm sure glad my sins are forgiven. I'm sure glad my sins are gone. And they're never to be remembered. And this is why in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16 through 14. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16 through 14. It says, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once a year, or once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacles was yet standing which was a figure for the time then present and in, in, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. There it is again. It, it's, it's confirming uh, what we just talked about, the blood of bulls and goats. It couldn't take away sin. And here it says again, these offerings that they would make uh, day by day and year by year, they could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. In verse 10 it says, which stood only in meats and drinks and jivers washings and carnal ordinances and posed on them until the time of reformation. That last part of that verse is very important. It says all these things were opposed on them until the time of reformation. What is reformation? It's a change. It's, it's when there's going, to be a, there's going to be a change brought about. It's not going to be the same as it was before. All of these things were opposed on them until the time of Reformation. And now in verse 11, But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, Neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, 
who through the eternal uh, Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Listen, the Bible says all of those other sacrifices, all those things before that were a shadow, that were an example, that were pointing to the true one, they could never take away. But the blood of Christ, when he brings that in, the Bible says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That word purge means to clean, to wipe out, to get rid of. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It gives us access into the holiest. It gives us access into the holy place. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16 through 19. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16 through 19. It says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Listen, I have access to God because of His sacrifice for me. I have access to Him not because of the blood of bulls and goats. Listen, that could never make them perfect. That could never take away sins. It didn't work for them. It was just a shadow. Listen. I cannot have access to God because of the works that I've done. I cannot have access to Him because who my family is. There is only one way that I can have access into the holiest, and that's by the blood of Jesus. Listen, having therefore, boldness, having therefore brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Listen, the last thing, it does away with all other sacrifices. The Bible says in, in verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 10, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now listen to verse 18. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Listen, there is no more offering for sin. There is nothing that you can give. There is nothing that anyone else can give that will, that will gain them eternal life. There is nothing. There was one offering. He entered in once. For us, He entered in once, listen, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Listen, having attained eternal redemption for us. Listen, this is what He did for us. It was His blood. It was His sacrifice. He fulfills His office as our great high priest. Listen, I love the song that says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Listen, I, that's where my hope is. It's built on His blood and it's built on His righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. Man, there's a lot of things out there that sound good, isn't there? Boy, if you do some good stuff and God will just look at you and smile and He'll be pleased. And no, no, there's only one sacrifice. There's only one offering for sin. And it was made once, and it was made for everyone. And if anyone is going to come to God, they're going to come to God through Him. Listen, He is the way. He's the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Him. His sacrifice is the only one that can give you redemption. Look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 through 25. Romans chapter 3. Verse 23 through 25, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all know that verse, right? We've memorized that one a few times. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in His blood, 
to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Listen, yes, we're all sinners, but we are justified freely through His grace by faith in His blood. Listen, I have that hope because it's sure, it's steadfast, it enters into the veil. It's the covenant that He's made with me that, listen, that's sealed with His own blood. I love the song that He says, He sealed my pardon with His blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. What a Savior we have indeed. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10 through 11. It does away with all other sacrifices. It says in verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Listen, the offering that Jesus makes as our great high priest, it is the only one that the Father looks at and is satisfied with. There's no other offering that can be made. There's nothing else you can bring. Everyone else that brings a different offering and says, I'll approach God my own way. They're just like Cain that said, you know what? God will accept my offering. It may be the best that you have. It may be the best that you can bring. But if it's not the offering that Jesus made, it won't be accepted. There's only one that can be accepted by the Father. Listen, he said, he'll see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. I'm sure glad that Jesus made the satisfactory offering for my sin. He did something that I couldn't do and you couldn't do and none of us, else, no, no, no one could do. But the only begotten of the Father, listen, Jesus himself, God's own Son, made redemption for us. He entered in once into the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us, and God looked at the sacrifice and He was satisfied with it. Listen, if your hope is built on anything else than Jesus' blood and His righteousness, it's not going to get you through. But if it's built on His blood and it's built on His righteousness, you have a hope that's sure, that's steadfast, it's the anchor of the soul. And no matter what happens around us, no matter what goes wrong in this world, my hope is sure. My hope is steadfast. It's unchanging. It's, it's, it, the Bible says it's, it's an immutable promise that He's given us. It's an unchanging. The Bible says it was impossible for God to lie. When He gave us this oath, when He gave us this new covenant, it was impossible for Him to lie, and He seals it with His own blood. What an amazing God we have. What an amazing great high priest that made a sacrifice for us that no one else could do. Thank you, Lord.